so we all know that climate change is already affecting Australia and the Black Summer fires um, of 2019-20 uh, were a very good example. David's going to talk about how climate change is already affecting um, horticulture, gardens, flowers, fruits, etc., through changes in temperature and also changes in rainfall patterns. And he'll talk about the future changes that are already locked in and how gardens and trees can play an important part in reducing impacts of climate change. Uh, Professor David Caroli is a Chief Research Scientist in CSIRO's Climate Science Centre and an Honorary Professor at Melbourne University. He's an internationally recognised expert on climate change and climate variability and he was the first person I was pointed to when I asked for a, our resident climate change expert. Uh, Professor Caroli was leader of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub in the Australian Government's National Environmental Science Program based in CSIRO during 2018 and 21 and a member of the National Climate Science Advisory Committee during 2018 and 19. So a very busy man. And he was elected as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science in 2019. Um, David, I'll pass over to you. Uh, thanks, Marianne, Thank for that introduction. And uh, look, it, it's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, talking to a group that knows a lot about um, horticulture and gardens. And I would love to have a conversation with you in the question and answer time at the end about what you're noticing about how your gardens have been changing and things like that. I should also add, and that's something that wasn't in my CV, is that I've been working with a botanical gardens consortium across Australia on monitoring of botanical gardens and using evidence from botanical gardens to look at how, if you like, horticulture and gardens are changing already, not just in Australia, but also around the world. And there is, in fact, an international consortium looking at climate change and botanical gardens as preserves and reserves for monitoring evidence of climate change. But let me start by sharing my screen, because what I'm going to try to do over the next half an hour is to cover, if you like, an update on what's been happening with climate change and where we're heading. And the first thing that I have to do is get the technology going to share my screen and then to actually get it to go full screen. So Marion, can you give me a thumbs up that you're now seeing yep, a full screen? All good. Excellent. That's a, a good start. Now, what I then have to do is to make a lot of the images disappear on my screen of the other people. I'm glad that you're still uh, involved. And look, what I'm going to do um, is start off by um, talking a little bit about the, the two images that are on this title slide. First of all, I'm going to start on the right hand side. And although this demonstration did not take place in Australia, I love the banner or the poster that someone's uh, uh, holding up about listen to the science in the IPCC reports, because in fact, on Monday of this week, the latest climate change science assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was released. And there was an enormous amount of media coverage on radio, on TV, and in newspapers about this latest IPCC report. If you want to get any access to that material, um, it's freely available and only 3,000 pages long. Almost no one has read the whole thing. There is a short summary called the Summary for Policymakers. You can access it through the link, but I have to tell you, I have not extracted new slides based on that report that only came out on Monday, because what I've found is in fact, almost everything that I had prepared from earlier this year is still not only relevant, it's based on effectively the same evidence because the IPCC reports use material that was published in 2020 or earlier since the previous report that came out in 2013. And part of that evidence is what I show on the left-hand side of this graphic, which is the global average 
temperature variations relative to the pre-industrial period. And here the pre-industrial period is defined as 1850 to 1900. And what you can see is yes, pronounced year to year temperature variations as well as some decadal temperature variations, but also a pronounced long-term warming and the global average temperatures over the last five years from 2015 up till 2020 are now averaging at 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels. There isn't going to be a quiz or a test at the end of this, but certainly remember that what we've seen over the last 120 years since about 1900 has been a warming of the order of 1.1 degree or about a tenth of a degree per decade. And now what I'm going to do is, if you like, start with a little bit of longer term context about climate change, because we know from plant based evidence, from ecological evidence, that there's been very substantial climate change over the last million years with periodic variations of global temperatures, here represented by temperatures from the Antarctic region. And these data come from ice core evidence. You can extract temperatures from the ice core evidence, essentially the isotopic ratios of water in the ice cores from uh, oxygen 13 and oxygen 18 in the ice. And you can also extract air bubbles showing the carbon dioxide concentrations. And what we can see is in the carbon dioxide concentrations, there are higher carbon dioxide and higher temperature variations. And these show this coupling between temperature variations and carbon dioxide variations, including colder temperatures until about 20,000 years ago, and then a very substantial warming. And the last 10,000 years has been relatively stable temperatures until something different happened and the carbon dioxide concentrations rapidly increased from the Antarctic evidence from around 280 parts per million, which there'd never been higher concentrations than 300 parts per million for the last million years. And now, well, it says we're over 400 parts per million. I'm going to switch to the next graphic, which zooms in. Now, we know that these sorts of periodic variations are due to changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. But it's also important to recognize that there is only one continuous human population that has survived the transitions from the depths of the last ice age to the current interglacial period and the current climate changes. And that is the indigenous peoples, the traditional owners of Australia, of the lands on which we now live in, it is the only continuous indigenous communities that have survived more than 60 to 80,000 years. And their stories of managing country, land country, and freshwater and saltwater country across Australia, their stories and song lines provide evidence of how they coped with 100 meters of sea level rise and more than five degrees of warming since the last ice age. And we can see the evidence for the temperature increases here and the carbon dioxide changes. But what we're now seeing is carbon dioxide concentrations that are higher than any humans have ever experienced across the globe. We would expect with that major additional climate change. So how do we know that those greenhouse gas variations aren't just natural variations like we've experienced in the past. Well, one piece of evidence is because they're higher than we've seen before. But there's also another really, really important piece of evidence. And I'm going to use this graphic, which shows what we would describe as an exponential increase in the carbon dioxide concentrations. We've heard about exponential growth in COVID cases perhaps in New South Wales or in Melbourne, but essentially spreads of epidemics. But this is not an epidemic. This is a change in carbon dioxide concentrations. What I'm going to show you is also a second graphic. And this graphic is the two of them together provide convincing 
evidence that the increases in carbon dioxide over the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution are due, not just primarily, are exclusively due to the increases in carbon dioxide due to burning fossil fuels and land clearing, due to human activities. Those increases are not due to changes in solar radiation. They're not due to changes in the amount of carbon dioxide are being released from the oceans because of warming. They're due to human activity. And what this upper graphic shows is the ratio of the carbon-13 isotope in the carbon dioxide to the carbon-12 isotope. Well, why is that important? That's the graphic down here. And this is because plants take up carbon dioxide by photosynthesis, whether it's plants that are in the ocean or like phytoplankton or plants on land, they preferentially take up carbon-12 carbon dioxide relative to carbon-13 through photosynthesis. So what this means is that, that when we burn fossil fuels or we clear land and remove the vegetation, we're preferentially releasing more carbon-12 carbon dioxide than carbon-13. And we can see that. That's this plummeting in the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. It means more carbon-12 in the atmosphere, in the carbon dioxide that's being released. This shows that Alan Jones and other commentators like, uh, uh, yeah, a number of other climate change deniers are absolutely wrong when they say that human activity couldn't cause the increase in carbon dioxide. Yes, it has. So let me move on to the next slide now. I'm going to look at Australian temperatures and Australian rainfall changes. And what this graphic shows is the changes in area average temperatures over Australia for the last um, 110 years since we've had high quality observations from the Bureau of Meteorology. This graphic is taken not relative to 1850, but it shows changes relative to the baseline period, which is 1961 to 1990. And the early period shows temperatures averaging around about minus 0.4 or 0.5 for the first 50 years, and then a very pronounced warming from 1950s up to 2020. And that warming is around 1.4 degrees or over 70 years, it's about two tenths of a degree per decade. That's about twice as fast as the warming rate for the global average temperatures. And that's critically important because as far as I'm aware, most plants in Australia and everywhere in the world grow on land and the land warming is about 50% to nearly double the warming globally average because the land warms up faster than the oceans. Yes, there are important plants in the ocean, uh, seaweeds and zooplankton, sorry, and phytoplankton as well as zooplankton. There are many plants in the oceans, but the dominant ones that you're interested in, I believe, are plants that are growing on land. And it's important to remember, land warms up faster than the ocean. And when we're talking about global average temperatures that I will talk about later, and limiting global warming to only two degrees above pre-industrial levels, that's the global average temperature. And the land average temperature will be about 50% higher than that. In other words, limiting global warming to only two degrees limits Australian warming to about three degrees and global land average warming to three degrees as well. So it's important to remember when you're talking about gardens and horticulture that actually the temperatures that the plants will experience is about 50% higher than the global average. Now, it's not just temperatures that are important for horticulture. It's equally important, maybe even more important to consider rainfall changes. But rainfall changes across Australia are much more complex than the temperature changes. The temperature changes 
are varying with more warming inland and less warming along the coasts, but they're not nearly as varied as we see for rainfall changes. And I'm going to separate the rainfall changes into the cool season changes and the warm season changes. And I'm going to start by looking at cool season changes in rainfall for the October to, uh, sorry, the April to October period for the most recent 20 year period, 2000 to 2019, comparing those to all other 20 year periods since 1900. And the graphic scale is pretty easy to understand. It looks, the dark reds are the lowest on record. And what we see is the Southwest of Western Australia and much of Eastern Australia has experienced very much below average rainfall or record low rainfall in the cool season. And we've experienced that in gardens in Southwest of Western Australia and through much of Eastern Australia has been the very substantial declines in cool season rainfall, particularly in winter and spring. We can look at the contrast then, and that is to go to the wet season in Northern Australia or the monsoon season, which is the warm season, October to April. And what we find here is that the wet season rainfall has actually shown increases in much of Western Australia and particularly in Northern and Northwestern Australia. Now we also know that the wet season rainfall on average is actually higher than the rainfall in Southern Australia in terms of the annual totals. So if the wet season rainfall is increasing as we're seeing in this graphic for the changes over the most recent 20 years, and we're seeing much above average rainfall for the last 20 years relative to the whole 100 year period, what we would expect is actually the total rainfall across Australia has increased. But we're not seeing that increase uniformly across Australia. In fact, we're seeing declines in the cool season rainfall and increases in the rainfall in the wet season in Northern Australia. And what this means is for instance, in Eastern Australia, in the Murray-Darling Basin, stream flows in the Murray River have significantly declined, even though there's actually been increases in the far north and northwestern part of Australia. Now, much of the impacts on horticulture and on gardens don't come just from the averages, they come from some extremes. And many of the extreme events have been changing exactly like what you might expect from a warming climate system. So the first thing we expect with a warming climate system is increases in heat waves, increases in hot days and increases in hot nights. And for horticulture, that can mean an increase in the growing season or an earlier start in the growing season and potentially some benefits because the number of cold days and cold nights has typically declined and the number of frosts on average has declined across Australia. Although in parts of Victoria and parts of Southwest Western Australia with reductions in rainfall and reductions in cloudiness in winter, even though we've got a mean warming, we've actually had some cases of increases in frosts in winter in Southwest WA and in Victoria because of the reductions in wintertime rainfall. What else have we seen? Well, actually a warmer climate system means the atmosphere can hold more moisture. That means heavier one day and one hour rainfall events, even in some regions where the rainfalls actually decline. So we can and have experienced, particularly in Europe over the last month and in parts of Australia at the end of the black summer fires, we had massive heavy rainfall events. And there's been increases in one hour and one day rainfall in many parts of Australia as well. As we've seen in Northwestern Australia, droughts frequency has actually declined because of the increases in rainfall, but drought frequency in the Mediterranean regions or in uh, Victoria and uh, Southeastern Australia, drought frequency has increased. Now, I'm gonna pick a few examples on the extremes 
And the first one I'm going to look at over here is the number of heat wave days. And this is based on the hottest 1% of days, 1% of 365 days in a year is between three and four days. And that's certainly what we see in terms of the number of unusually hot days for the first 50 years or so, but the most recent 20 years has seen massive increases in the number of very hot days averaged across Victoria, as many as 15 very hot days. In other words, five times the expected, four to five times the expected frequency. Now, these increases in very hot days also lead to increases in extreme fire danger. We've seen substantial increases in fire danger in like the Black Summer events. But we've also seen a longer fire season with the extreme fire danger days also occurring in spring in Victoria and in New South Wales, whereas previously the fire season would be starting in December, January and February, the summer season, we're now getting the fire season starting earlier, sometimes in September and October. So let me move on. I need to uh, give plenty of time for questions. I've only talked about the past variations that we've seen already. But if we want to look into the future, we could use a crystal ball my practice at looking with crystal balls is that they don't work for me at all. And if I want to look at climate in the future, what I tend to use is complex mathematical models of the climate system that are called climate models. And what we can do is make use of the climate models, not only that have been run in Australia by CSIRO, but also make use of more than 40 different global climate models that have been run since 1850 right up to the present, either with no increases in greenhouse gases, which is this gray band at the bottom, or with the observed increases in greenhouse gases right up to 2010, and then the projected increases in the future, that's what is shown in the blue band here. And the future simulations are then shown out here further to the right from 2020 onwards. Now, the first thing we can see is this black band or line here is the observed 20 year average temperatures across Australia. And what it shows is that these average temperatures, first of all, the year to year temperature variations show lots of variability. The model simulations that I'm using are run day to day and year to year with coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere and the land surface from 1850 right up to the future. Average all of the data across Australia, extract the data and then compare it with the observation. The blue band here is the simulations with increases in greenhouse gases. The gray band agrees fairly well with the observations right up until about 1940. And then the observed temperatures seem to show pronounced warming. And that pronounced warming does not agree with the model simulations that don't include the human caused emissions. And it's only when we include the human caused emissions that we get good agreement of the model simulations with the observations. Now, what about in the future? Well, if we want to look what's going to happen in the future, it's clear that if we get good agreement with the observations in the model simulations with increasing greenhouse gases, we better use the model simulations with increasing greenhouse gases into the future. Unfortunately, yes, 2019 was a record hot year in Australia. If we look at the future simulation right out to 2020, sorry, right out to 2040, beyond 2020, 2019 becomes an average year for Australian temperatures. Even though it was a record across the whole of the last 120 years, it becomes a normal year. And that shows that pronounced warming is expected to continue, not only for the next 20 years, but essentially for the foreseeable future unless we rapidly reduce emissions. Now we can also extract rainfall data from these simulations. 
black line here shows the observed rainfall in Victoria. And across here is the observed rainfall variations in the southwest of Western Australia for the annual rainfall, not just the winter season. And the band here is the climate model projections of what we'd expect by 2030, starting from the 1990s. And what we see from the 30 year average, sorry, the 20 year average rainfall is it's tracking at the worst case. Yes, there's large year to year variability, but both Southwest of Western Australia and Victoria are tracking at the worst case of the model projections. So if you're looking at climate models and want to look at what you might expect from the future, some people would argue, well, let's just take the mid range. If we took the mid range in the climate model projections out to 2030, you would be underestimating the observed changes up to 2020. You better to look at what's happening recently and you find that it's tracking the worst case. Okay, well, let's look at the worst case for climate model projections, looking at two different future scenarios. We can look at future scenarios for rapid emission reductions. And unfortunately, this graphic looks at changes relative to about 1995. And remember, we'd already had about seven tenths of a degree warming by the 1990s. So you've got to add seven tenths of a degree to these warming. And it shows one degree of warming by 2100 if we rapidly reduce emissions for the mid range. But you've got to add seven tenths of a degree to that. So that makes 1.7. This is showing the upper range. Remember I said we should consider the worst case is about one and a half degrees plus 0.7. It actually shows that very low emission gives a 50% chance of warming less than two degrees or a 50% chance of warming greater than two degrees. That means a 50% chance of land warming greater than three degrees for very substantial emission reductions. And I'll come back to that. What does it mean a little bit later? What about if we don't reduce emissions? Well, this is four degrees of warming mid range, five and a half degrees worst case, more than six degrees in the worst case for no emission reduction. Oh, six degrees, but 50% more on land. That's nine degrees warming on global land. That is a planet that no humans have ever experienced. And likely many plants and animals would not be able to cope with those changes. So let me now talk about the impacts and I'm going to finish up in a couple of minutes. I'm gonna go through this graphic starting at what I'm going to talk is the 11 p.m. clock face and go round anti-clockwise. This is the summary of impacts in Australia for climate change expected by 2050. Yes, we expect global temperatures to continue to increase, sea level rise to continue to increase and of the order of half to one meter of sea level rise around Australia. Half a meter by 2050, one meter by 2100. Marine heat waves will become more frequent and more intense. That won't affect plants on land, but it will affect sea weeds and uh, uh, sea grasses in the oceans close to land, and it will also affect the Great Barrier Reef. But I've already talked about more heat waves and fewer cool days. We've seen many of these impacts already in the most recent two decades. We've also seen longer fire seasons and more dangerous fire weather, particularly in 2019. More intense rainfall, cool season rainfall is expected to continue to decline. In some sense, what these impacts are saying is we're expecting more of the same. The only problem is we've seen this with one degree and we're heading to two degrees of warming by 2050. Exactly as I said before, the conditions in 2019 are expected to become the normal conditions by 2040. So <clears throat> one way to think about the impact of those sorts of temperature changes 
and their impact on horticulture is to think about the sorts of gardens you might expect, for instance, in Melbourne or anywhere in Australia. And this graphic has a link to something called the climate analogs. It's a tool that allows you to think about, well, where are you now? What's that climate like to, be, to become under the climate changes we expect by 2050 or 2090. This uses a high warming scenario for the climate of Melbourne with about four degrees of warming and 10% less rainfall. That means that Melbourne in the 2090s would be expected to have something like the climate of Adelaide or the inland climate of inland New South Wales, somewhere inland of Sydney or inland of Canberra, but at a lower elevation at sort of mean sea level. So that's an interesting way because the plants and gardens in Melbourne now aren't like the gardens in Adelaide, and aren't like the gardens in inland New South Wales, inland of Sydney. Substantial warming, but this is a really useful tool to think about what it means for horticulture, what it means for gardens in the future. It's also really interesting to think about actually the seeds that are used and the timing of planting of seeds. It was recognized in the United States that those seed planting guides for regions of Australia or seed planting guides in the United States, they've been shifted poleward associated with the warming of the climate system. So we've already talked about the fact that there's been substantially greater warming on land. That's what we expect. For gardens and planting, there's also been a significant poleward shift in terrestrial plant-based systems because the plants are moving to areas that are similar to the climate that they're adapted to. And similarly, there's been an upward movement of ecosystems in alpine areas as well, with vegetation systems moving upward in the mountain areas. There's also been an earlier flowering and an earlier migration, earlier flowering of plants, earlier migration of birds and insects. So all of this advanced phenology has already been seen and we're expecting it to increase. Now, one of the interesting things is you'll often hear people say, well, actually, there's benefits from climate change as well. And sure, you've got to weigh up the benefits with the adverse impacts. In terms of gardens and plant growth, there's actually been an increase in land-based plant growth across the whole planet, despite the impacts of temperature change and rainfall change. And some of that has been primarily because of the longer growing season in the Northern Hemisphere, leading to enhanced plant growth in the high latitude regions, together with the increases in carbon dioxide, leading to enhanced plant growth and higher carbon dioxide also leads to improved water use efficiency in plants. So both of those are benefits, but actually, the temperature changes and the rainfall changes are really going to overpower the increases. There will be some regions like the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere where there'll be some impacts, but the increases in bushfires, the increases in droughts, the increases in temperatures are not going to lead to ongoing improvements in growing season or in plant growth. So what do we need to do? If we want to avoid these dangerous impacts on plants, Yes, plants can be used as important to take up carbon dioxide for the atmosphere. We've got to end up with zero net emissions. We will only stabilize carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if human emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, fall to zero. And if we want to limit global warming, at around two degrees, that means that carbon dioxide emissions have to fall to zero due to human activity by about 2040 or 2050. And any later than that, or any ongoing emissions of carbon dioxide will lead to further emissions. And there are not yet sufficient commitments across countries around the world to limit carbon dioxide to net zero emissions 
by 2050. But that's what we need to do. We need to limit human related emissions of carbon dioxide to zero by around 2050. If we don't, there's going to be greater and greater impact. So we can look at this. This is a, what's called a burning embers graphic. Talks about the impact of higher temperatures on a range of different systems, on ecosystems. I'm gonna focus on the terrestrial ecosystems. And what we can see, we're already at one degree or more. This graphic was uh, made uh, in the last IPCC assessment, not the present one. And this is the temperatures for the period around 2000 to 2015 in here. But we're already exceeding that. We're now at 1.1 degrees above that scale. You can see that for terrestrial ecosystems, the impacts associated with the burning, the red colors are getting bigger and bigger at one and a half degrees and two degrees and even greater for even further warming. So if we can limit global warming to one and a half degrees, we have less impact on terrestrial ecosystems. If we can't, we end up with warming globally greater than two degrees. There'll be even bigger impacts. So it's critically important to limit global warming to the lowest level possible. So I'm gonna finish up. I'm gonna hand over to Marion in just a second. I hope that I've made the human influence on the climate system clear. The more emissions we have, the greater will be global warming, the greater will be the disruption on our climate, the greater will be the impacts on gardens, on horticulture, and some of those impacts will be irreversible. We know how to fix the climate change. We know how to fix the climate system. We just have to limit human emissions of greenhouse gases, of carbon dioxide to zero, and we need to do that as soon as possible. We have two choices. We can either choose to limit global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, or we can choose to do nothing. Doing nothing is a choice to make global warming worse. It's not a choice to do nothing. It's actually a conscious choice to make global warming worse. And if we make that choice, there will be increases in the impact on horticulture and increases in impacts on our gardens. You can try to adapt, adapt to those un, uh, ir, the uh, unavoidable impacts. There are many unavoidable impacts because essentially one and a half to two degrees of warming is locked in. I hope that you make the right choice, but that choice is up to you. And I leave it up to you and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Marion, I'm gonna stop my sharing and hand back to you. Thank you very much, Professor Caroli. Um, even with all the um, work and research I've been doing over the past couple of years in climate change, I've learned a couple of things myself there. Thank you. Now, um, if, if anyone has questions, you can either unmute yourself or you can put them into the chat um, bar. I can't see any questions there at the moment. Um, so I might start off with one myself. Um, David, the, um, you talk about people limiting their emissions. In the horticulture in industry, can you see anything in particular that horticulturalists themselves can do? Um, what would be the main thing that you would suggest they do to limit emissions? Um, yeah, look, remember what I was talking about was net emissions or net zero emissions. So the best thing that horticulturalists can do is maintain and plant more plants, preferably trees, and preferably shift away from fossil fuel use in their electricity and fossil fuel use in any appliances that they use. So using battery driven appliances is fine, as long as the way that you charge those batteries is from renewable electricity sources, don't use fossil fuel generated electricity. So both of those things are critically important. The horticulture, 
planting more trees, maintaining those trees and storing the vegetation, the plants for as long as possible, recycling the materials or storing it underground is critically important. Um, can, can I ask another question sort of based on that, please? This is Go Penny. ahead. Go for it, Penny. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think one of the things that a lot of gardeners um, I, I get really concerned about is our government who is doing nothing and um, pretending they're doing something. Um, and I don't see that as a political statement. I just think that is a fact. Um, so the, it's really good to hear you say that that we can feel less helpless in our gardens by planting something and continuing to plant something and keeping to, I mean, this is what I write about all the time to people in the magazine that I work for. What I'm, what the other thing that I'm not entirely sure about is how, um, how much difference does it make the way we treat our soil um, <clears throat> and storing carbon in soil? Is it, I, I come back all the time to using solar panels. We, in Australia, we have actually made a difference to the carbon emissions in this country because so many individual houses have solar panels on them. Can we do something like that with our gardens? So with planting trees, with keeping gardens full of plants, can we also do it with the soil? Uh, so the simple answer to that, Penny, is yes. Everything you said, I completely agree with. Unfortunately, I'm not officially allowed to comment on uh, Australian climate policy and given this is being recorded, uh, I can't uh, comment in detail about that, but you've said many of the things that I probably would have said if I was allowed to. But in terms of what we can do, we know that Australian soils are very, very substantially depleted in organic material. Over the last 200 years, we have good uh, evidence from 100 years ago that European agriculture has significantly depleted the soils and that those practices of agriculture uh, in an ongoing way would essentially and have in many places substantially depleted the, the fertility of the soil. So we know from experience that adding more carbon material into the soils improves their fertility, improves the growing uh, of uh, fruit plants, of horticulture, of gardens, it's critically important. And I don't need to tell you that you know how important it is to, to be doing the mulching and the composting and things like that and the benefits. But critically importantly, doing that will also increase the carbon in the soils, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and benefit the soils as well. And it actually is a really important benefit Various estimates indicate the soils are 90% depleted in many regions of Australia and increasing soil carbon can substantially offset that, usually in terms of agricultural regions associated with changes in grazing, but I'm sure it's also true associated with changes in horticultural practices as well. So, so you are definitely saying that if all the gardeners around Australia started doing these things, that it would actually make could make a substantial difference in the same ways we have with solar panels. Uh, yes, it probably wouldn't be quite as big as in solar panels because the area for agriculture is probably larger in geographical area than the area of gardens in the homes or fruit gardens. But it will make a difference. And look, the most recent um, IPCC report, the one that came out on Monday, makes a much, much clearer statement that every tonne of additional carbon dioxide emissions increases global warming. But the opposite also applies. Every tonne of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere and put into the soils reduces global warming. So every ton that you store out of the atmosphere from collecting the plants and adding it to soils is a small amount less global warming. So think of that in a positive way that what gardeners, 
Horticulturalists are doing can potentially have a major impact on reducing the magnitude of global warming. Thank you. A couple of questions here in the chat. Um, one was in terms of the graphic where you showed crop yields and, and against terrestrial plant growth and you had mangroves and you know that that graphic. It said um, it appears to show crop yields less impacted, less red than terrestrial plant growth. What's the reason for that? Uh, that's a really good question. And it's primarily because the crop yields are managed and are often managed with irrigation systems. Now, they're not all managed with irrigation systems, but they are managed, whereas the natural ecosystems may not be adapted as well. And certainly the agricultural systems sometimes modify the crop choice to suit the changing temperature or rainfall conditions. So that management can be an adaptation response. But I've not yet seen, except in the movies, trees uproots and walk across to a cooler climate system. It takes time for the trees to shift the thousand kilometers that Melbourne has to shift to adapt to the sorts of, well, maybe it's the ecosystems would have to shift from inland New South Wales down to Melbourne to respond to those sorts of changes. But that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing that the changes in ecosystems are shifting hundreds of kilometers southward to move into cooler climate regions. But the plants can't do that. that. However, the agricultural systems can be managed to do that. And that's why the changes are somewhat slower, but they are still very impactful. But really, I'm gonna to shift to agriculture now, but it also applies to horticulture as well. A very recent study by the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics, ABARES, showed that there's been a very significant 23% decline in agriculture and commercial horticultural productivity in the Murray-Darling Basin and across the whole of Australia over the last 20 years compared with the previous 50 years primarily due to climate change. So these changes, we had previously seen growth in incomes. The growth in incomes has stopped and there's been a significant decline in profitability of agriculture, of farms and horticultural productivity associated with climate change. Changes in temperature and changes in rainfall. Okay. Um, another question. Um, would you please re-explain the significance of carbon 12 and 13 as evidence of human activity and explain the basic differences in origin? So sure. where does 12 and 13 come from? Okay. So carbon 12 is the common isotope, and that's the one you learnt about in secondary school, probably in chemistry lessons, where you heard about isotopes and the most common carbon isotope is carbon-12. Carbon-13 is a not a radioactive isotope, but it's produced by high energy solar radiation, cosmic rays that break up and, uh, the uh, carbon in, that's in the atmosphere and add an extra neutron. Doesn't make it radioactive, it just adds an extra neutron. And so that extra neutron makes carbon-13 not carbon-12. It occurs naturally, it's not radioactive, but it occurs at a much, much lower fraction. The graphic that I showed was the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. Now, some of you might used to be, might be aware of the way that a still works in making alcohol and separating alcohol from water. Or maybe you've heard about it, but haven't done it yourself. Now, alcohol is a lower atomic weight and a lower molecular weight than water. So it's more volatile. Exactly the same thing happens with carbon-12. Carbon-12 is a lighter molecular atomic weight and a lower molecular weight for carbon-12 carbon dioxide than carbon-13 carbon dioxide. 
It's more volatile. It's taken up preferentially by photosynthesis with the carbon dioxide taken up through the stomata in the leaves of the plants relative to carbon-13. So plants preferentially take up more carbon-12 carbon dioxide. Hundreds of millions of years ago, those plants were buried underground and made coal. And when you dig up, they call them the same with plants in the ocean. The pre plants preferentially take up carbon-12 carbon dioxide than the carbon-13 carbon dioxide. So when oil is formed, natural gas is formed, or coal is formed, the fossil fuels from hundreds of millions of years ago, they preferentially take up carbon-12. When we burn it, they release the carbon-12. The same thing when you chop down trees and they decay through biological activity, they're releasing carbon-12, carbon dioxide. So land clearing and burning fossil fuels increases the carbon dioxide, and that's why the carbon-13 carbon dioxide, which is still being produced, but there's less of it compared with the carbon-12 carbon carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, because humans have been releasing lots of the carbon-12. Does that make sense? And is someone happy with that question? Otherwise, just go back to high school again. Um, so I think it's Steve says he's been involved in a program to reduce fertilizer off-gassing and runoff of nitrogenous compounds. He's asking, what can gardeners, the industry, do to emulate these actions? Look, that's a really good question. And I'm not as much an expert on uh, nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen fertilizers, but certainly agricultural use of nitrogen based fertilizers can lead to increases in nitrogen nitrous oxide release into the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide is a long lived greenhouse gas that is associated with release from fertilizer and from animal urea as well in gardens and in agriculture. But in particular, if you're using nitrogen based fertilizer, it will lead to nitrous oxide release. Nitrous oxide lives in the atmosphere with a typical lifetime of over 100 years is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And although it doesn't have high concentrations, the increases in it are a significant contributor to increasing uh, global warming, as the same with methane related emission, related emissions from, for instance, uh, animal agriculture or from ongoing fracking and uh, natural gas release. So look, there are multiple greenhouse gases. I've focused on carbon dioxide because that's the longest lived greenhouse gases in terms of natural processes removing it. But if gardeners can reduce their use of artificial nitrogen based fertilizers and use more natural based fertilizers, uh, either through mulching or other nature-based fertilizers, organic fertilizers, then there is a less, less uh, how would I say, nitrogen runoff and less nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. Um, Trevor says people are getting anxious as politicians argue about whether climate change is even happening. What can we do to give hope to ordinary gar about or, or to ordinary gardeners to do something. We can't wait for police to accept the science budget plan and implement paid changes. Trevor, move to Victoria. We're all putting climate change action plans together. Yeah, but actually the really interesting thing is the state politicians in every state of Australia, whether they're Labor or Liberal led governments in each of the states, every state has a very strong climate action plan, not only for adaptation, but also for reducing emissions. And every state and territory in Australia has a plan to reduce their emissions to net zero emissions by 2050. The Australian government does not. That's not a comment on the Australian government policy, but differs from the state-based policies. And every state has strong action plans. It appears to be that the, how would I say, the climate denial aspects of some politicians predominates in the national parliament, not in the state 
faith-based parliaments. And I can comment more about how would I say changes in federal and national policy in the United States, rather than I can comment in um, Australia, but certainly in the United States, a change in the president at the last presidential election had led to dramatic changes in the national policy and improvements in the, uh, how would I say, the national action plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with a range of different activities in the United States. Another question from Trevor. Um, it takes nurseries about 10 years to select, grow, trial and introduce new plants. Can they do, deliver plants for a change in climate in time to counter changes before they happen? Uh, they can. And I think that's a really important question. A number of the sort of, um, I guess I would call it uh, environmental bodies that are seeking to reintroduce native vegetation in um, areas that have lost much of their native vegetation 20 and 30 years ago required that the vegetation needed to be drawn from seeds from within the local region. However, what some people who tried to do this rehabilitation of the native vegetation have discovered that their planting strategies of drawing seed stocks from within 20 kilometers of that region have been failing, particularly in Victoria and the southwest of Western Australia, but in many parts of Australia. And I'm aware of a number of organizations now that are saying, use the climate analog approach to pick the geographical region that the plants are likely to be experiencing in the climate in 20 or 50 years time, which typically means using seed drawn from 100 to 200 kilometers further north. And often, if you're talking about southern Australia, in a drier climate as well. And so drawing your seed stocks in your gardens, if you want to plant for a climate adapted garden for the future, you need to use plants and seed stock from 100 to 200 kilometers further north, probably in a drier climate unless your gardens are in Northern Australia, when it, yes, it'll be hotter, but it might also be wetter as well. Um, Steve's got another question. Um, would you please comment on the effects given the IPCC indicates we'll reach 1.5 around 2030? Um, what, what will accelerate some or all aspects? Yeah, so look, the really interesting part about that headline is that it's wrong. The IPCC did not report that there was going to be accelerated warming and that we would pass through, that there was going to be an earlier occurrence of 1.5 degrees of warming. They actually talk about a range of dates. And unfortunately, people in the media for this report picked the earliest potential date of exceeding 1.5 degrees, not the mid-range date, which is roughly the same as previously. And the range is between about 2030 and 2050 for exceeding 1.5 degrees. Um, the mid-range of that is about 2040. That's much the same as it was before. There is, if we continue high -er rates of emissions, that it could well happen earlier. And if the warming occurs at this, how would I say, faster than projected rates of warming, yes, we're going to sail through one and a half degrees, maybe 2030 to 2040 and continue further warming. The current commitments are not enough to limit global warming to below, well, to, to one and a half degrees. We'll overshoot if we rapidly reduce emissions. If we can get to globally, net zero carbon dioxide before 2050, we could probably limit global warming to two degrees. If we need to limit global warming to only one and a half degrees, 
net zero emissions of carbon dioxide has to hurt, probably occur by 2040. That's a really, really difficult proposition because that's going to happen globally. Not every country, but some countries are going to have to go to net negative emissions. And the only way you can go to net negative emissions is using technology that doesn't exist yet. Mr. Dyson hasn't yet invented the vacuum cleaner that sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. In fact, he has no plans for that technology at all. Um, it would be nice if there was a vacuum cleaner at scale that sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The only one that I'm aware of are trees. And we don't have enough trees that we can plant to suck enough carbon dioxide that humans have added to the atmosphere over the last 100 years. So look, we know what we've got to do. We've got to do everything possible to go into net negative emissions because once we've gone to zero emissions, we've got to then keep on sucking it out to return to the climate that some of us were used to 50 years ago. We've gone a little bit over time, but I might just um, throw one last question at you. There were others there and we can put those on notice. Why do they say Australia will be more affected by climate change than other countries? Uh, look, Australia isn't affected by all other than all other countries, but it's affected more than all other developed countries. And that's because all other developed countries sit at lower, sorry, at higher latitudes than Australia. Australia straddles what's called the subtropical dry band of deserts with some regions in the tropics, but most of Australia is at low latitude, straddling this subtropical belt. It has more rainfall variability than any other developed country, hotter temperatures than any other developed country, less benefits in terms of having a very cold climate than any other developed country. So warmer temperatures, more variable rainfall and more droughts affect Australia more than any other developed country. Oh. Okay, so there's well, no I... good news unless you're a plant grower and can grow plants better associated with higher CO2. But there are many disadvantages as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. It's been a really informative talk. I'm sure everybody's enjoyed it. And if there are any more questions there, um, we might just pop those through to you for some uh, resolution. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, thank you for giving your time, David. It's been a long day for you, I know. Uh, look, you're welcome. And one thing I just wanted to finish on is to say that Marion's going to share the presentation and the, the recording of the talk uh, onto the website, I think. But yeah, everyone's welcome to have a look at the, the PowerPoint slides and things like that.